Amen. What a blessing to think about that day. If you have your Bibles with you, I'd ask you to turn to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 61, and we're going to begin reading in the very first verse. Isaiah 61, we're going to be reading the whole chapter, but it's short. Isaiah 61, beginning in the very first verse, the Bible says, Then the Spirit, then the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to build up the broken hearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of ven the, ven and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn. To appoint them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. And they shall build the old waste, and they shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. And strangers shall stand and feed your flocks, and the sons of the aliens shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers. But ye shall be named the priests of the Lord. Men shall call you the ministers of our God. Ye shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and their glory shall ye boast. For your shame, for your shame, ye shall have double, and for confusion they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in the land they shall possess the double. Everlasting joy shall be unto them. For I, for I, the Lord, love judgment. I hate robbery for burnt offering. I will direct their work to truth. I will make an everlasting covenant with them. And their seed shall be known among the Gentiles, and their offspring among the people. All that see them shall acknowledge them, and that they are blessed seed which the Lord hath blessed. And I will greatly rejoice in the Lord, and my soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and a bride adorneth herself with her jewels, for as the earth bringeth forth her bud, and as the, gar as the garden causeth her things that are sown in, in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring, be to spring forth for all the nations. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your goodness and watch care. Lord, we thank you for your blessings. Lord, this morning we pray that you would meet with us most of all. Lord, we pray that you would stir us up to your service. Lord, uh, we pray that you would give us a joyful heart. Lord, those that are lost among us, Lord, that you might manifest yourself this day. Lord, for those of us that walk at a, di uh, a distance from you, Lord, that you might uh, restore us close fellowship, Lord. We need that in this, our last day. Lord, we pray uh, that you would uh, convict of sin, Lord, that you'd show us where we may be. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now here we find a set of scripture that is to be to Israel and that they would have joy. That they would be in a rejoicing state. That they would uh, uh, treasure what they have with the Lord. Now we live in a day and age where by and large people do not rejoice in the Lord. Really the truth is they could care less. Uh, and when you find people that have a, a bend toward the things of God, they have no joy. Really, they have no interest. They're talking about this, and they're talking about that, and what if, and maybe, and there's no joy. You know, uh, it never ceases to amaze me for people to come to the house of God with their mind on worldly things instead of the things of God. It, it never ceases to amaze me that they don't come here with happiness and gladness, but rather they come looking for a problem. You know, uh, we should be a people that have a joy about us, that have a gladness about us, and they come to the house of God with our minds to serve Him. 
that should be our joy. So I also want you to know where in the book of Isaiah this occurs. Uh, Isaiah had pronounced judgment on Israel. Isaiah had said, this is the end. Isaiah said, you will go in captivity. You will be a desolate nation. You will be broken down. Now with all that said concerning the judgment of God, he comes back and gives them hope. He comes back in 61 and says it's not going to always be this way. He comes back in chapter 61 and gives them a promise of restoration. Now, uh, that's a wonderful thing. Now, just because you're saved does not mean it is always going to go well. Uh, the Bible says of Israel, of the Jewish people, uh, that, they were, uh, that they were the apple of God's eye. That they would, He made a promise to Abraham, you'll be from everlasting to, uh, the, to the very ends of the age. You'll always be a nation. You'll always be a people. And He keeps that promise. But I want you to see they got into problems. Uh, they got into idolatry. They got into worldliness. They got into uh, things that did not make them follow the Lord. And because of that, they were judged. You find idols being raised in the temple. And we live in a day and age where many times idols are being raised in the temple of our life. And things that we uh, think are also important really mean nothing. That, that is the day which we live. That is where we have arrived. So with that background in the first verse... I want you to see that, that Isaiah credentials himself and says the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Now there's two truths that you need to know always. Number one, that your pastor or the preacher that you're listening to is standing on this and not on man's ideas. You know, it doesn't matter uh, uh, what Spurgeon wrote. What matters is what is right here. It, it doesn't matter what uh, whoever you look up as a preacher, what they have said, what was written what right here is what matters. Sometimes I think we've been given in to man's ideas and when we search them out, they're simply not here. Uh, we get too enthralled with mankind. We get too enthralled uh, with what man has to say. So we find Isaiah credentials himself and says, The Spirit is on me. And he says, Anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. Now, at that point, as, uh, Israel was still a prideful, mean nation. They were still against God. But he says, He sent me to tell you when you do become meek, there's an encouragement. There's hope. You know what? God's people need more than anything else to be meek. To let self-pride go. And as long as you're stuck on self and got your chip right here, you're not going to do much for the Lord. Because if you have your chip right here, somebody's going to knock it off. And if it's not one of God's people, and it could be, especially if we're out of the will of the Lord, you'll have a worldly person uh, to knock it off and say, hey, what are you going to do about it now? That, that, that is the nature of man. And so he says, if you're meek, if you're given to the Lord, if you don't have that prideful spirit, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Now, I ask you, how many times this week, how many times in the last year even, have you been brokenhearted? You know, you know what the opposite of brokenhearted is? It's pride. The, the opposite of being brokenhearted, what did he say many times? You, snip, you stiff neck and hard hearted. So the opposite of being broken hearted is to be hard hearted. And we live in a day and age where that's at. We, we see a lot of hard, hard, hard hearted people that really could care less if people go to hell or not. They, they stand on the doctrine of election and predestination alone. And they have forgotten the compassion that goes with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just presenting the truth. 
just presenting uh, what he's given us. So as Isaiah, he says, I've come to preach this. Uh, I, I've come to present it to a broken hearted people. To preach good tidings unto the meek. He that has sent me to bind up the broken hearted to proclaim liberty to the, captive, to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Now, I want to ask you uh, this morning, what prison do you sit in? Well, what is the prison that you're abiding in? Now, I'll give you a couple of the modern day church, the prison of I could care less. The prison of disinterest. Okay, we'll make it through one more service and we'll get back to work on Monday. That's a prison of disinterest. Get three more weeks in and a home vacation. That's the prison of disinterest. You know what should be our focus right here, right now? I love my children all the way from uh, Adam all the way down to Bella. But if you're not real careful, they will become a prison. Because they will become the apple of your eye. And Christ will lose his position. And that is where he's supposed to be. So as Isaiah is beginning, really this time of extreme encouragement, he says, I want you to realize your prison so you can be free. Uh, verse 2, his message to, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the, day of and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. Now, I want you to see there's a lot of people out today that believe the here and now is the acceptable year of the Lord. I've even heard preach salvation from this text. But what I want you to see, in, in a literal sense, he's talking about the rebirth of Israel. That was an acceptable year of the Lord. And even more deep than that, after we're gone as the age of grace, they will become the acceptable fruit again. They, that, that, that's the acceptable year of the Lord. Uh, Donna has a friend, uh, more than one really, that is Messianic Jew. <clears throat> and she's traveled to Israel right now, and in her mind she's fulfilling this prophecy. And, and let me say this, she is not. Uh, it, it is not that way. Verse 3, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, and to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy... For morning. Now I want you to see that one of the promises, and it's the one we're going to focus on because it's the one that we like the least of, and that is the joy, the oil of joy. Now what does oil do? Uh, my mother-in-law is a great fan, and my wife too to some extent, of healing oils. And I'll say this, we won't get too deeply into that, that is a real thing. That has been the medicine of God's people for many, many, many years. Now, with that said, I'll say this. The one we lack most, it's not frankincense and it's not myrrh, it's joy. You know people that lack joy always like to make other people commiserate. I've never seen people in misery that like to abide there alone. So they'll drag you down too. You, you think the scripture saith in vain? <clears throat> Come out from among them and be ye separate. Now we, we always use that for a biblical separation. But you know what? I don't want to hang out with a bunch of Debbie Downers. I'll, I'll just leave them and say, you know what? Forget it. You know what? Well, you know what you can be brought down the most with is someone else's opinion of you. You know what? It don't matter to me. If I'm in line with the, God, with the God of all the universe, I don't care what you think of me. You say, well, that's not the right attitude. Well, if you're bringing me down, it's the right attitude. I'll pray for you, but I'll leave you. Come out from among them and be separate. If you're going to, be, if you're going to drag me down, I'm not going to hang out. Because I want to be in the will of the Lord. So the first thing that we need to look at is how joyful are you in the things of God. You say, Brother Larry, 
I don't know. Well, what was your attitude when you came from the house? Did you drive in because it was Sunday morning? Or did you see it as an opportunity to give God praise? Did you see it as an opportunity to encourage those that are about you this morning? Did you see it as an opportunity to sing praises to the mighty God of heaven? Did you see it as an opportunity to hear from God? See, we don't look at church as an opportunity anymore, but rather we look at it as a, as a necessary. Just like you clock in and go to work, you've got to be there. That, that is not service, whatever you think. And what you'll end up is a very miserable individual. If you think you have to be here, you're already miserable. You know why I come? To preach the glorious gospel of Christ and to lift His name up. That's why I'm here. And, and, and that's the, that should be the truth of every one of us. That should be the goal. And, and, and you know what? A bunch of people that are in this condition, what are they going to be used? What are they going to be used of the Lord for? I mean, really. Are we usable in that condition? I think not. Are we ready to serve the Lord? No, no. Uh, so I want you to see in verse 4, And they shall build up the old places, and shall rise up former desolations, and shall repair the waste cities and the desolations of many generations. So verse 4 is really talking about revival. Yes, he's repairing the cities of old Jerusalem, and all, he's repairing the cities that all built all around the nation of Israel. But I want you to see more than that, it's repairing lives. Now the problem is this, we don't even realize when the cities broke up. If you follow the, follow the nation of Israel and their occupation of the land, when they approached the city, what was always the first thing that met them? The wall, right? We rejoice in the story of, uh, of the walls coming down. And the only one being spared was the harlot, Hagar. I mean, the harlot. And uh, she had the scarlet thread. But I want you to see, as those walls came around from Jericho, they were always met that way. Now, we need to understand and know what brought these cities down that are now being repaired. The very first thing was your wall being knocked down. Now, I ask you this, what has the devil done today to knock you all down? Now, when the wall is gone, you have an exposed city. Once the, once the wall is no longer in opposition, the city is easy to take because there's no protection left. Uh, you know, is that not what they, uh, what, what did the devil say uh, in response to the Lord when he said, Have you considered my servant Job? And he says, You built a hedge about it. He wanted the hedge removed. He wanted direct access. So the first thing that we often lose as Christian people is this. Is we lose our wall or we lose our hedge. And we find ourselves open and very vulnerable to attack. And then when the attack comes, we begin, well, what am I doing here? You've lost your joy. The Lord be glad in the things of the Lord. Lord be able to give you praise and lift His name up and be joyful in the things that He's given us, the thing that He's provided us, the means of salvation. Verse 5, And strangers shall stand and feed your flocks, and the sons of alien of the alien shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers. Now that is where these messianic people get in to going back and, and, and taking on labor roles for the Jewish people. They get it, they pull it from this verse. But I really want you to see that the promise is this for is that they'll be they'll be sustained. And the promise for us is this. Number one, don't be ashamed to be a vine dresser. Don't think you're too good to do that job. Don't think you're too good to be the stock. Don't, don't think you're too good to get your hands dirty. 
Uh, don't think you're too good to dig down. You know why we have so much misery in God's people today? They're too idle. This right here will consume your life if you let it. And I say it by experience. If you can't handle it, don't have one. Right? So, with that said, I want you, want you to see that they were satisfied with the, the primary job. They're given the promise you're going to have servants come in and do the menial task. You're going to have servants come in and do this for you. Verse 6, But ye shall be named the princes of the Lord. Men shall call you the ministers of our God. Ye shall eat the riches of the Gentiles. And in their glory shall you boast yourself. What a wonderful promise. Verse 7, for your shame shall for your shame ye shall have double, and for confusion they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, the in their land they shall pass uh, possess the double everlasting joy unto them. Now, I'm going to give you two things there. We're going to move on. How many of any kind of honesty can say? since the Lord saved them, that they've always been joyful. Not a one of us, right? Every one of us in here, one time or another, have hit rock bottom. Why? Why? Why did Jericho fall? Why, why did we fall? Why the, is our joy snatched? It's because we get our minds off the Lord every time. What fruit of the Spirit is joy? Number two, right? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering. So, what happens if you're stuck on one or stuck on two? You never, you never see the rest of it, right? Goodness, gentleness, faith, mercy. You, you know why Pete, God's people are so hard-hearted? We, we've never got past joy. We're, we're so scared of being clumped into the holy roads that we've lost our own joy. At uh, the meeting yesterday, Brother... Uh, John uh, heard it. He clapped his hands at prayer time and said, Blessed be the name of the Lord. And, and the reason why, uh, listen, the service was fixing to be closed and no one had even had the opportunity to say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Well, we are so blocked into one, two, three, and this is how the service is going to go. We don't have even an opportunity for men to say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen and amen. Selah. How many times have you heard people do that? And I would say it would go in, in my little tiny hand. And you know why? We're embarrassed. Mm -hmm. You know why? We don't have joy enough to do it. Now, I'd rather you not do it than to put on it. Yeah. But I, even everybody knows what putting on is. That's what mom always called it. Pretended. Mm -hmm. Not... Doing something when it ain't really there. And I've seen a lot of that too. But but we ought to have the joy enough if we're saved, if we've been if we've been lifted up in the Lord to, to praise Him in the new way, to praise Him as He should be, to lift Him up and give Him glory and give Him honor as do His blessed name. Verse 10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for He hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. Now, I want you to see His two things for giving Him glory. Uh, number one, I want you to say, He says, I will rejoice 
in the Lord. Now rejoicing is different than being just joyful and having joy and happiness because that's kind of a recoil action. When we shoot a big gun and we get that jerk back, after, that's the recall of the gun. And there's a recall to joy and that's rejoicing. Don't see it very much among God's people. And you know why? To get the recoil on the gun, what do you got to do? You got to shoot it. And to get joy, the rejoicing, you got to have joy to start with. You got to be able to lift his name up. You got to be glad in the things of the Lord. So what brings you down? What robs your joy? Now, if we will be real honest, we know. Now you may not admit it, but you do know. And, and, and each of us, each of ours could be a little different. Each of ours could be uh, a, a, little, a little different in our nature. I, I tell you, as a preaching man, many times what really will rob me of my joy, whether good or bad, whether my fault or the hearer's part, I don't know, when there's no interest in what's being said, or just, here we go again. If I shoot out my joy, and huh, people are looking at me like a statue, it robs me of my joy, and there's certainly not going to be any rejoicing, because the joy has never been sent out to start with, right? Yeah. So we as the Lord's people ought to be able to rejoice in every circumstance we're getting, if we believe He's sovereign, we have to believe He's sovereign on the way. Now go with me to the book of 1 Samuel. We read of a lady that became very joyful. And I'll say she became very joyful because she was not joyful to start with. She was not happy. She was not living in the things of the Lord. Now, I want you to see a couple of things. First of all, in 1 Samuel, if you know the story of Hannah, she was barren. She had no joy. Now, ladies, when you, when you have that first baby, you're sending out joy. Birth of little Abigail, and I see all those pictures, and getting to see Gracie on a, on a routine basis, and her toddling about and running. Uh, that's a joyful thing. But for me to receive that, and to rejoice in her birth, she had to be born. Right? Sarah and Adam sent out the joy, and I rejoice in, in that little thing every time I see her. Now, Hannah did not have that opportunity yet. Hannah was buried. Really, Hannah is what most people want to be today. The women want to have a career and not have children. But Hannah was of the Lord, and Hannah was an old school woman, and she knew that her place was to have a child for Elkanah, and that they could go on and, and live together and be happy. Now, I do want you to see in verse 6, that's one verse, uh, 1 Samuel 1, 6, and her adversary, which was the other wife, Nina, and her adversary also provoked her sore to make her fret because the Lord had shut her womb. Now, I want you to see that when, when you're in trouble, the devil's people are going to come by and give you, ha ha, you don't have no babies, I have four, you can't even come up with one, you're, you're down in the dumps, I'm going to drag you down a little further because your, your situation is so stupid. Your situation, you know what? You deserve your situation. You got yourself into that and you can get yourself out. Now that sounds a whole lot to me like Job's buddies. Do you? you know, that was Panana making fun of Hannah's situation. Gigging her every time she could. You know what? The devil will do that to you. Yeah, the devil will send your panana your way and 
she'll do her business and she'll do her job and you'll remain miserable. Now you know one thing that brought Hannah out of the situation that she find, found herself in was Hannah had a good prayer life. Now her husband was an encouragement to you, to her rather. And he said, you know, I don't care if you have a thousand sons, I love you. But you know what? When you know where you're supposed to be, encouragement by others <laughs> saying, oh, you're in good shape when you know you're not. It's very empty words, aren't they? And that, that, that was, that's really what Elka, uh, uh, her husband, uh, that, that's what her, his words were really empty because uh, she knew her joy wasn't full. She knew that she was in misery. You know what the problem is today? Most people are not even willing to, to recognize and to admit when they're miserable. You know what? If we would really be filled with joy this morning, the, the house would be filled with the Holy Spirit and I wouldn't have to encourage people to speak of the things of the Lord because they would do it on their own. They'd be filled with joy. They'd be filled with happiness. They would rejoice because I'm filled with joy and nothing else. So, Hannah did and Hannah says, you know what, I have a real problem. You know, what a blessed thing today would it be if God's people had enough, uh, enough about them to say, I'm miserable. I need some help. I want to be joyful, but I'm not. Now let me say this, enjoy. Joy in the Lord, not in this world. Because joy in this world is very temporal. It'll soon go away and it'll be done with. Now, drop down in verse 26. 1 Samuel 1, verse 26. You know the story. Uh, Samuel gives her the desire of her heart. I mean, excuse me. The prophet gives the desire of her heart. And Samuel is born. But I want you to say this as she's praying before she's granted her request. <laughs> the prophet thought she was drunk. So, <laughs> don't you have any respect for God to come down to his house loaded? So that says to me, when we're in sincere prayer, most people won't get it. And it looks different than everyday prayer. Everyday prayers when you, you know, you bow and you listen to Brother Junior and you listen to me and you listen to Eric and you listen uh, to Brother Terry and to Brother Ashley and you get your little thing in and you pop back up. Dear friend, that's not prayer. You can call it what you will, but that is not prayer. And so we see then that that she experienced a great miracle. She'd been given the desire of her heart. She bore a son. And she had joy. She had great and wonderful joy. She was able to give her husband a son herself. Now, she was so joyful. And all of you that have children, and little Gracie right now, those first three years are incredible. You just see them uh, progressing so quickly and see them so happy and, and developing their language skills and, and being able to do things and talk all about the house. But at that third year, can you imagine giving him to someone else? That's what Hannah was going to do. That, that was Hannah's plan. She was going to rejoice. She had great joy. And so she was going to give that joy anticipating rejoicing herself. So in verse 25, uh, the Bible says, And they, meaning, Eli, uh, meaning the Elkanah and Hannah, and, and they slew a bullock and brought the child to Eli. And she said, Oh, my Lord, my soul liveth. My Lord, I am the woman 
that stood by thee here praying unto the Lord. Now I want you to sketch the picture of that because that blessed child was fixing to be given away. She was fixing to give him back to the Lord God. She was fixing to place him in the temple and she says, My Lord, my Lord, I'm so happy. I'm the one that was fretful before, but I'm the one that's glorifying him now. Ladies, imagine taking, uh, just taking uh, Bella's four now. I can't imagine taking her and saying, okay, you do with her what she seems, what seems well to yourself. I had joy, and I want you to rejoice with it. I had joy. Eli, you take him. Eli, Eli was a good man, but he didn't know much about children. If you, if you don't think that, look at uh, Phinehas. Uh, Hophni and Phinehas were not good sons. Can you imagine taking your children to a situation and you know that he was not a real good father anyway? Well, the reason she could, she knew God would take care of the situation. She wasn't giving him to Eli, she was giving him to God. She, she was rejoicing in the things of the Lord. She was rejoicing in, in, in giving Him to God. She was happy to fulfill her promise. What a wonderful thing if we could do the same thing. Verse 27, For this child I prayed, and the Lord had given me my petition, which I asked of him. Therefore also I have led him to the Lord as long as he liveth. He shall be led to the Lord. And he worshipped the Lord there. Uh, lending your children to the Lord is a good thing. Uh, giving them and saying, okay, God, you use them for whatever you, you would have them to do. I'm going to lend them to the Lord. Now, most of us are much too selfish for that. You know, uh, I was talking to Donna uh, the other day. She made fun of me a little bit. And I said, well, you know, Matthew and Dessa were... Sarah and Adam got to get together and give me a grandson. Looks like carrying on the Lafferty name is going to be up to me. Well, first of all, carrying on the Lafferty name, it should be, uh, that's up to God. Right? Uh, I mean, I only have three dozen granddaughters. Right? That, that, won't, that won't do a whole lot. But we ought to lend it. Say, you know, Lord, whatever, whatever you want, I'm rejoicing. Well, whatever your desire, if you want them to be uh, uh, down here at the temple, or if you want them to be serving in the backside of the desert, Lord, whatever you want, that's what I want too. And she worshipped him. The first verse of chapter 2. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoiceth. There's our word, rejoice, joy and rejoicing. She wasn't upset. She wasn't got, she didn't have the boo-boos because she wasn't going to see Samuel anymore. She was rejoicing. Thank you, God, for him. Here he is. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for being in your will. Here's my life. You know, that's really what salvation should be about this morning is when we're saved, saying, there, whatever's left, if you get saved at 70, whatever's left, if you get saved at 12, whatever's left, those years, Lord, they belong to you. Here they are. Use them the way you would. That's rejoicing in the Lord. See, the reason we don't rejoice, we never send the joy out to start with. The reason, the reason we don't rejoice you don't see other people sending out any joy either. If uh, Brother Terry said, Amen! And then Brother Ashley said, Amen! You see, his joy caused his joy, which caused his rejoicing. Makes sense, don't it? Yeah. Yeah. It, make, it makes sense. And so we see then that we as the Lord's people, Hannah was in a situation where she gave great glory and praise to the honor of the Lord despite what a situation that we would see hopeless in giving our children to somebody else. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoiceth in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. Now, this horn uh, has two meanings, really. Number one is a trumpet. You're blowing a trumpet and saying, Oh, I'm lifting you up with music. And the other thing is like a family lineage. The horn, the line of Adam, the line of Matthew, 
in line of Sarah. That is my horns that blow out my name and what I stand for. And that's what she was saying. She was saying, man, my horn's been extended. I have a son. I'm going to give God great praise for it. And you know what? She was rejoicing later because she gave Samuel to God. She got five children in return. And in addition to those additional children, we have seen Samuel called of God, given a vision for the rest of his life. He served God faithfully to the end. That's rejoicing. Remember, when the Lord called him, Eli was so far out of the will of God, he didn't know what, what, what was going on. He said, well, I didn't call you to go back to bed. Second time around, I didn't call you to go back to bed. And then it says, boy, Eli, he perceived it was of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And he says, next time you get back in there, you just say, here, here am I. And we see a great, wonderful thing. And the reason why Hannah knew how to rejoice, Hannah knew how to give praise unto God, Hannah knew how to lift up the name of the Lord. Verse 2, There is none holy as the, Lord, as the Lord, for there is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like our God. Can you imagine tonight someone like Hannah going, There is none like unto our God. There is none like unto our Lord. He is magnificent. He is great. He's strong. He's sovereign. He does all things well. If you heard that beside anybody but me, how would you feel? Right? You say, well, Larry, I hear you say it every Sunday. Well, I need a little recall. If I say it every Sunday, then I need some recall, right? right. If I'm the only one enjoying it, you know what? Eventually the day to die, I'm sure. Eventually, the joy is going to be taken from me as well. And so we see, we see that Hannah give the Lord great praise, lifting him up unbelievably, giving him great glory and honor. Verse uh, 3, Talk no more so exceedingly proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by Him actions are weighed. Now two things I'm going to end. Number one, he says, she says, talk no more exceedingly proudly. And let not arrogance come out of your mouth. So that means we can talk the wrong way. I want to see the Lord lift it up. But don't you see the fake? That's being arrogant. Yeah. That's saying something that's not there. That's a lie, right? And don't do it proudly. I, I've seen some people in other groups kind of knew that they're just putting on a little bit. Want to be heard. Want to be seen. Hannah says, don't you do it that way. You give praise unto the Lord. You lift Him up. You give Him great glory and honor. And certainly she did. She was greatly blessed of it. Can you imagine each year when she went back? It says she made a little cloak for him every year, a little coat, take the next size up when she went. Saw him and he progressed in the things of the Lord. He wasn't a very, very old boy when the Lord saved him. Could you imagine that trip back to Jerusalem? Elkanah and Hannah come in there and the little boy runs to him and says, The Lord saved me. He gave me something I didn't have before. I've heard from God. And year by year. And you know, at some point it had to be that Elkina and Hannah didn't show up no more. Elkin and Hannah had to get old. Elkin and Hannah had to get to the point where they didn't make the trip anymore. They weren't able. Elkin and Hannah had to get to the point where they died and went on. But you know what? I believe that Samuel kept going. Mm -hmm. He was not a compromiser. Remember what he said? He said to Saul, this day is the throne taken from you. Remember what he said to Jethro? He said, do you got any more sons? This, this is not him. You got any more? <laughs> and 
He said, well, I've got, I've got one little fella back here on the back side of the farm, but that's not him. He said, you bring him to me. He broke that oil and anointed him. He said, this is you. See, he served him to the end. You know what? We should give the Lord great praise. Brother Junior, you come. Mm -hmm. Don't